Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Chemistry and the Properties and Structures of Matter video series and this is number 22 on ionic and covalent bonding. Well we already looked at the fact that there is a relationship between electronegativity and um, the type of bonding which occurs between atoms. So let's take this a little bit further now and start to try and look at some specific examples. So uh, here is the element neon. It has 10 protons in its nucleus and it has two electrons in the first shell and eight in the second shell. Now, I haven't um, broken this down into the subshells and we certainly could do that. But in actual fact, the Bohr model explains a lot of this bonding behavior well enough. So we don't need to go into all that additional detail at this point. But we can explain what's going on in terms of bonding in this kind of a way. The element before neon is fluorine in the periodic table. It's element number nine. And it has two and seven in its um, electron shells. The element after neon is sodium. And sodium has 11 protons. And it has an electron configuration of two, eight and one. Fluorine has a very high electronegativity. That is, it exerts quite a significant force on an electron, attracting it into this outer shell. Sodium, on the other hand, has a very low electronegativity. And as a consequence of that, its attraction for this particular electron, and certainly for any other electron in the um, surrounding vicinity is very low. What happens when these two get close together is this electron here is attracted by the nucleus of the fluorine atom. And as a consequence, the, nu the electron actually changes. It moves from this atom's um, cloud region to this atom's. The consequence of that is we have a change in the electron configurations to mimic that of neon. But the overall effect of that is that we still have nine protons here and 11 protons here, which means we have an excess electron for fluorine, but we have one fewer electron for sodium. And as a result, fluorine gets a negative charge and sodium gets a positive charge. And when we bring these two into the same vicinity, they are going to attract one another through electrostatic attraction. Another way we can show that is to use structures called Lewis structures. Now, Lewis structures are um, little diagrams that try and represent what's going on in the valence shell or atomose shell. It gets a little messy to try and keep drawing atoms every time we want to show what's going on. So if we draw, if we just use the symbol and then draw dots to represent the outer shell electrons, we get a better sense of what's going on. So you can see here's sodium again, and sodium only has that one outer shell electron. So we just leave a little dot. This time we're looking at chlorine, and chlorine, like fluorine, being in the same group, has seven outer shell electrons. So you can see uh, it kind of looks like it's missing one in this position. When the sodium and the chlorine are close to one another, the strong electronegativity of the chlorine pulls the electron away from the sodium atom. And so as a result, we identify that sodium now has no electrons in its outer shell, and you can see that it doesn't. And the chlorine now has eight electrons in its outer shell. To identify that this has actually occurred in such a way as to create a charge, we identify the sodium with the plus here and the chlorine, which now has this extra electron from sodium in its structure. Uh, we've put in these little square brackets along with its charge. We can show the same thing for magnesium oxide, the two in this case, outer shell electrons of magnesium will enter into these positions for the oxygen. And so again, the oxygen will have an overall negative charge, the magnesium a positive charge, and so on for calcium. Now we can continue to work through this for a number of different types of examples. And the only reason I've added the calcium one in at the bottom is that you can see in this case, calcium has two outer shell electrons. Fluorine only has one space, 
And so therefore, if calcium is going to bond with fluorine, it needs to make sure that it actually has two fluorine atoms in order to take up these two electrons. And that gives us a formula of CaF2. Covalent bonds are another type of bond that form when two nonmetals combine. But this time, when we try and look at what's happening, we can see that there's one outer shell electron for hydrogen and there are six outer shell electrons for oxygen. Now, this isn't going to make either of them happy through the donation or acceptance of electrons. So what has to happen here is we end up with a sharing arrangement where the hydrogen is sharing its electron with an oxygen, which also has other outer shell electrons and is also sharing with another hydrogen. In this case, our Lewis diagram identifies our pairs of electrons that are shared as a consequence of two atoms donating their um, individual outer shell electrons. And also for, in the case of oxygen, these other what we call lone pairs of electrons, which are not actually involved in the bond. So if I was to draw this and replace the, the shared electrons with bonds, then it would look something like this. And I will say something because in actual fact, the water molecule looks slightly different, but that's a story for another video. So here's a couple of examples for you. We've already had a look at water. Carbon dioxide and methane are ones we've made with model kits, and we can use the Lewis structure to identify these two. Now, I'm a long way over time, so I'm not going to do that, but I will do it in class. And, uh, and if, you, if you're watching from somewhere else, then this is a nice little exercise for you to have a look at. Thanks for watching.